Hello and welcome to Views from the Sideline. I'm your host, Joey Tyson. My partner, Malik Hill. We're in August already. We just got done with the NBA draft. There's free agency happening. Football's about to start. Summer League started yesterday. Not the official Vegas League, but like the California and Utah small little things. Yeah, so there's a lot to talk about now. The and best time of the year is here. Yeah. Basketball this, and football. I like this time of the year and the springtime where it's like March Madness and all that. But, yes, it is full swing NBA, NFL, college football. Great time of the year. So, we were last here on draft day last Thursday. Yeah, we were surprised about many picks. Yes, and we a got lot of surprises. We got to see the Pistons get the first overall pick since 1970, taking Cade Cunningham, which was fantastic. And then after the first three picks, anything was possible and anything happened. Um, so we're gonna recap the draft, give the give some grades, talk about some of the best drafts, some of the worst drafts that we saw. Um, And then we'll transition into some free agency, winners and losers, and then we'll wrap it up maybe with a little bit of uh, NFL training camp talk. So, Malik, draft overall for the Pistons. Let's start with that. Overall for the Pistons, you got Cade Cunningham, Isaiah Livers. I I really – Michigan guy. It it was like the ideal, like, pick in my mind, but I didn't think it would actually happen. And first – they took JT Thor, and I thought that was the pick. And I was <laughs> like, that actually is a really good pick. But then that pick got traded to Charlotte. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, the Pistons made a lot of uh, second-round swaps. Yeah, They moved around a bit. I was hoping they would move up back into the first round, but they never ended up doing that. But I think they they salvaged what they had with solid picks. Yeah, so Isaiah Livers, high-level three-point shooter. Good defender, could be very high-level. 3 and D guys, you need them on a really good team. Mm-hmm. And yeah, to build something that's going to last and something that can go far in the playoffs and be consistent in regular seasons, you need these ty- these types of guys, the glue pieces. Like Sadiq, Sadiq Bey is a higher-level version of what Isaiah Livers mm-hmm. is. And Isaiah Livers could be his backup, Yep, honestly. Yep. I mean, that that's if the shooting translates, which he was consistent at Michigan. He got better every year. Yeah, He shoots – Almost ninety, almost over ninety from the free throw line, and he's athletic too, mm-hmm. six eight, almost six nine. Like he, he's just he has great size. He's a great shooter, and he defends. He's a great piece to have coming off the bench for a building team. Yeah, especially with guys like uh, when we lost guys like uh, Wayne Ellington and that. Yeah. Um. So we need those, like you said, those three and D guys, um, off the back end. Uh. Then, after Isaiah Livers. Very interesting pick they had next. A pick that Malik had said previously would not be drafted. Gets drafted to the home team. Luca Garza, Big Ten Player of the Year, now a Detroit Piston. What's your thoughts on this? So, now that he's a Piston, I'm looking at the good more than the bad. Mm -hmm. The fact that he is a really good shooter. The fact that he is a very good player in the post. And if you play him like 10 to 12 minutes a game, he can produce for you when you get in the ball. He's high IQ. Mm-hmm. He's never he's never been known as like a very like great passer, but he can hit the open man in the corner, and he can find the open man whenever he gets in the post because when he starts to, st- to score, he gets more attention. He can draw more foul calls, stuff like that. Yeah. Now, he's never going to be the quickest guy. Nope. He's never going to be very agile. He's never going to be a high-level defensive player. He can improve on the defensive end, Mm -hmm. but he's never going to be a high-level defensive player. I am hoping that he could possibly develop into what Frank Kaminsky has become throughout his NBA career and what he is for Phoenix right now. Mm -hmm. A guy that in the – let's not even talk playoffs. A guy that in the regular season you can depend on to come in and play minutes, hit open shots – be effective in the pick and roll. Be tough on defense. You don't have to be a high level guy that that is dependable to like get stops every time. Yeah. Just don't get cooked. Don't yeah. become Enos Cantor out there. <laughs> Just a body. Yeah. I I mean Yeah, he's he's six eleven. He's almost like two fifty five, two sixty. So he has the body to be able to 
play tough yeah. and stay in front of guys. So if he can become a Frank Kaminsky type player that can come in, set picks, hit open shots, mm-hmm. and not be terrible on defense. Like I said, I wouldn't bring up playoffs, but Frank Kaminsky just played when DeAndre Ayton fouled out and they brought in Frank Kaminsky. He played really good minutes for Phoenix. Yeah, he he's smart. He got he got some re- like key rebounds. He scored around the basket when they needed it. If Luka Garza can become that type of guy, then he could be effective for the Pistons. Yeah, and he'll he'll be the guy that stretches the floor off the bench. Um, they did sign. We'll get to it later or more in depth. They did sign some other bigs, so. Their front court is actually kind of jam packed at the moment, but Luke is not a guy that's just going to immediately slot in. I don't think. I think if he gets going, he could make his way to the backup power forward or something like that. Uh, but no big expectations right away. But I like the pick overall. The, I went back and ended up watching a lot of his highlight film, and like you said, he's a really good shooter. Stretches the floor put the ball down on the floor a bit. I mean, he's, he's not very athletic. He's not super quick, but he's just a big body. Has good post moves. I say that lightly because the, the one problem that I saw, and maybe it's just because of the college game, 99% of Luca Garza's post move is a right-hand hook. Yes. Spinning or, off or his left shoulder. Fake hook, get them to jump, and then either get fouled and won. Or come back with like a lefty layup. Yeah, but a lot of the times his comfort is that right hand jump hook. Now in college, nobody could really stop it. NBA, I'm assuming people will figure it out. So that's one slight concern. But honestly, I see him more of just a guy that will stretch the floor, be able to be an offensive tool uh, for the offense, and you know maybe he'll turn into something. Pistons final draft pick. Out of Florida State, which I actually like this pick. Wait. I I, I want to yeah I want to talk at the time. I thought it was a solid pick, just a like major project. But mm-hmm. yeah, um, they take uh, Balsa Koprovica, uh with the fifty seventh pick. Uh, that was I think that was from Charlotte when they traded. Um, seven footer, seven uh, foot one to be exact. Seven foot one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he showed very good signs. At Florida State, and I felt like, especially this year, when I, I watched closely, watched some of the tournament, he looked really good at times. And now he most likely is going to go overseas and play for maybe a year or two. Um, you don't think they're going to have him in the G League? I hope they do, but there's just been talks about, you know, maybe him playing overseas and then coming in. I do hope that it's more of a G League type of thing because I think he can be ready sooner rather than later. Honestly, yeah, I I think that he has more of a ceiling than Luca Garza. Yeah, and I think that the thing with him at Florida State, when you go to Florida State, Leonard Hamilton has whether you're one through five, you are going to play a role. Florida Leonard Hamilton has never had that one guy that comes in and just is a scoring superstar, Mm -hmm. or a guy that's just an ISO player that like comes in and lights it on fire. He always brings in guys, even if they have that type of talent. You're going to come in freshman to senior, mm-hmm. even if you like lead the team in points and you're like a really good shooter, you're going to play a role and you are going to fit that role so the team can win. Yeah. And that's why Leonard Hamilton in Florida State has been so successful over the past 10 years because they just have tough teams that are defensive minded and dudes that play their specific roles on offense mm-hmm. and they're always consistent. Which is a, I think it's a big reason why we haven't seen the most of what Balsa has. Mm-hmm. Because coming out of high school, also before he was even a senior in high school, when he was like a sophomore and junior, he was considered like a top 20 player in the country. Because he was that size in high school, and he showed a lot more when he was given the chance to like be a go-to like big man for his teams. Yeah. But then he went to Montverde as a senior. He took a backseat to a bunch of dudes that just got drafted. Mm-hmm. Goes to Florida State. Play your role as the five man, which is to be defensive minded, rebound, get layups and dunks when you need them. But like you said, in this past tournament, in this past season, he showed a lot of signs of what people saw when he was younger. Mm -hmm. Whenever he got the chance to shoot a jumper, it looked smooth and it looked good. Sometimes even from deeper range. I don't know his percentage from from the free throw line. I wish I would have looked that up before this. But Mm -hmm. when he shoots jumpers, it looks smooth. It look it doesn't look very bad. Whenever he's gotten post touches. 
he doesn't have like many many moves, but he has a hook. He has like a turnaround to a layup. He he has things to work with. Yeah. Along with being seven one, like two fifty. He has a lot of potential and if they if they put the work into him and they keep him, he could he could be something. He could be a good like rotation guy for the Pistons in the future. Yeah, I agree. I like I said, I really like the pick because um what I saw from the tournament I really liked from Balsa. And I just think that there is a chance that he could be something. And they the, the Pistons don't really need him to like if he doesn't work out, he doesn't work out. But if it works out, it'll be great. Yeah, um, I, I think if he was more athletic, he he probably would have had a higher draft profile. Yeah, and people would see more like a, a lot more out of him. Mm-hmm. He's he has some athleticism, but it's nothing like like when Chris Dapps Porzingis came into the league, yeah. or these guys like Evan Mobley or DeAndre Ayton. These guys with like real like quickness and like real athleticism. Mm-hmm. Balsa has some of it, but like. It's it's nowhere near what those guys had. Yeah, I just looked up his uh his free throw percentage was right around seventy percent. Not so. bad for so it's not yeah. it's not great, not terrible, kind of right in right in the big guy average, I would say. Yeah. Um, something you can work with. Yeah. So what would what would you say the Pistons like if you could give them a grade because everybody wants to always give a grade for the draft? What would you what would you give the Pistons? I would honestly give them an A minus. Okay. Actually, no. I'm giving them an A. Yeah. I, I, I was, I was starting to think too critically. Getting Cade Cunningham in this draft. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's a potential centerpiece superstar, most likely All Star, but the ceiling is superstar for him. Yeah. You get him, and then you trade back, and it looks like you might just start taking flyers on guys, but you get a guy in Isaiah Livers who could be, who could play for them this year, and produce off the bench. A guy in Luca Garza who. Yeah, a lot of people don't see the ceiling. We know there's not a very high ceiling with him, but there's a high floor with Luka Garza. Mm-hmm. You know what he can do. You know he can shoot. You know he can give you points. And he's a big body that can be used on defense. And Balsa, that's where you take a bit of a swing, and it's a swing that's kind of worth it mm-hmm. because with his size and the potential he has and has never been able to fully show throughout his college career, it was a it was a pick worth taking in my opinion. And yeah. yeah, you you have your number one pick and then you have two guys that could produce for you and then your last pick is a guy that if you if you put work into him, he could become something. Yeah. That's what that's what I ended up with too. I ended up with an A. I did the same thing. I was trying to think like, oh, should I give them like a B plus, A minus? And then I was like, it's just too critical. You got the number one pick, you took Cade. Yeah. And then you took Isaiah Livers, who's it should fit in nicely, like you said. And then Luca and Balsa, I think, are really solid. Like, you know the talent that's there. It's just if you think you can get that out of them in the NBA level. If they can, it's gonna be it's gonna work out great. If it doesn't, it doesn't totally hurt the team either. Um, so I like it for that aspect. You got really high end talent late in a draft. Um but they just have some question marks to them, I guess. Yeah, the the fun, the really good thing with Balsa is he's not as raw as most like European big men that come in mm-hmm. because he was in, he played American high school basketball and he played D one basketball for Florida State. He knows what it's like to play around these types of athletes and at this level. Yeah. So it's not good. Even if he doesn't play this year, it won't be a extremely hard transition for him because mm-hmm. he knows what to expect and yeah. he knows how to play the game. I agree. Uh, okay. So we left off. We did the whole um, lottery to the draft. Ended on Moses Moody going to the Warriors, which I thought was great. Um, anything that jumped out to you in the first round after we left? The Rockets took Jalen Green, which we a lot of us expected, but... I think for them to be able to snag Alperin Shingun with the yeah the 16th pick. Yeah, they traded that from uh, OKC. They get Alperin Shingun. They get Usman Garuba, who should be a defensive force for them. Mm-hmm. And you end up getting uh, the, the two guard from Arizona State. Josh Christopher. Yes. And you end up getting Josh Christopher. Who, yeah, you you have 
uh, Jalen Green and you have other two guards. You have Kevin Porter Jr. But he is another guy with that, like, just, just raw offensive talent, a guy that can get a bucket and has, honestly, a lot of defensive potential. He he was up and down throughout his freshman season, but there were moments where he looked really good on both sides of the ball. So for the Rockets to be able to snag all that was really, like, wild to me. Mm-hmm. Cam Thomas sliding all the way to 29 was crazy. 27. 27, yeah. Him sliding all the way to Brooklyn to a team where they signed Cam Thomas. I mean, they draft Cam Thomas, and then they sign Patty Mills in free agency. Yeah. So you have guys that can come in and produce on offense and give you high shooting, even if Kyrie and James and them, if there's injuries or they're out for some reason. You have Cam Thomas, and they were, still, they were able to get Dayron Sharp too. So the the fact that Brooklyn ended up having a good draft was pretty surprising. I thought they were just invested in what they had as a team. Yeah. I I was a little disappointed though that Cam Thomas went to Brooklyn. I feel like it's going to it's going to hinder his growth a little bit. I know it'll help playing with those that type of talent, but at the same time I feel like he's a guy that you want to be able to slot in for a team. I I'm just surprised that like teams like the uh, I guess the Knicks ended up with Keon Johnson. No, the Knicks didn't get Keon. Oh, yeah, they traded that pick. Yeah, they That was it. what's weird. It's like the Knicks trading out, and they could have had some pretty solid options, I think. Um, so for Cam Thomas to fall that far, we thought he might have jumped up in the draft yeah. and didn't end up – that didn't end up happening. Uh, Af- after a week, how do you feel about that Josh Giddy pick? Where are you with Josh Giddy right now? And the, and and him going that high? Uh, I still question it. Um, so let's do that right. Let's just go right into that. Let's start with the worst drafts. Who do you like? Who do you like? Speaking of Josh Giddy, because I'm a little questionable on it. I don't know if I'm gonna say that. Uh, I don't know if I can say that OKC had one of the worst drafts, but who would you think? is a team that had a really bad draft overall. I don't know if there's a team that had, like, a terrible draft, honestly. Like, Memphis, like, swinging for Zaire Williams and then going with Santi Aldama, who everybody has to look more. Most people outside of Memphis won't really look into him. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just to see why they took him. I haven't yet. But I would say Memphis most likely, but. Yeah. A lot. There are a lot of scouts that think this. That's that season he had with Stanford. Like you can just like cross it out. Yeah, I mean, there, there was, are people that think like because they didn't get to practice at their own facilities, they had a weird season. Like he was never to really get a footing in what they were doing, mm-hmm. and then the, and then it was over, just right. like that. Yeah. And his percentages weren't high, and he had some good games, but he had some down games. So I don't. I really don't know what to think about Zaire Williams. I have to see him play. And a lot of people think he could reach his potential. Yeah. Because and he, of, yeah. He was a projected lottery pick before he went to Stanford. Yeah. So that's kind of where, you know, that that occurred. Um, And then, like I, like I was saying, OKC didn't have the greatest draft because I felt like it was a reach to go with Josh, Josh Giddy, especially when a guy like uh, Jonathan Kuminga was there. Um, I know that their their forward spots are kind of, starting to get a a little bit crowded but at the same time like passing up on a guy like that seemed a little odd to me but they kind of saved it because i like the trey man pick i like jeremiah, the jeremiah robinson yeah, Earl those, pick. those two picks i because of those i can't say i they felt like they got draft. good value for those guys exactly so it was hard there um i'm still not on board with the king's davion mitchell pick yeah and this is after they their first G League game yesterday was in the California Classic mm-hmm. against the Warriors. He had twenty three and looked really good. Yeah, but De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese Halliburton are the starting guards for that team. Yeah, when you get into into the season, I'm not sure where that's gonna work out. Exactly. Like I I really like him as a player, but I wanted him starting on a team. Yeah, that was like rebuilding or like stuck in the middle. Mm-hmm. Like I I feel like I wish he would. I almost wish he would have slipped. All the way to fifteen, so the Warriors. I mean, so the Wizards would have taken him. Yeah, I really wanted him to end up in Wa- in Washington, where they just get rid of Russ. You're playing. You're starting with a whole bunch of young guys. You still have Brad Beal, but he'll probably be gone soon. And yeah. then you throw in Davion Mitchell, so he can start and get his thing going very quickly. 
Mm-hmm. But now, is is he just a backup? Like all all this talent and potential, he's such a good yeah. defender. Who he 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 was an inconsistent shooter in at like his first three years of college, but he finished so strong. Right. So people are still wondering how that's going to end up. But high level shooter for one season, very good defender, really quick, really athletic, good finisher around the rim. But he stuck behind two guys. Yeah. Like what is what is that rotation going to look like? And I don't want to hear like starting a three guard road like three guard lineup. Like it's Bledsoe, Drogic, Drogic, and Isaiah Thomas in Phoenix again, which was a disaster. You, that's not going to work. Yeah. So I, I, I just don't understand what Phoenix's plan is with him, because if he's not starting, and you're not giving him a chance to like take control of a culture on a team, mm-hmm. I, I don't understand what the what the point is. When De'Aaron Fox is the face of your franchise, but you're bringing in a guy to try to change the culture, and try like be a leader of a team. Mm-hmm. That's not the star. Like so, who who's who? Who are you trying to give the power to in right. this? So th- yeah, that one I'm still like off with that one. And then Josh Primo, the pick of the draft. <laughs> yeah, th- another swing. Listen, San Antonio has had a incredible track record over their franchise history, especially between like the '90s going like to the 2010s. Mm-hmm. They hit from everything. Like, from Tim Duncan to Kawhi Leonard, they almost hit on every pick they made for yeah. a long time. Even if, like, they drafted some some guys, like, Nando DiColo only came over here for, like, two seasons. But he's been a star overseas for years. Yeah. Like, they've they've hit on so many picks. Mm-hmm. Are they, they – they now have, like, four or five guys on their roster that look like they are not going to hit, like, star level – that they've drafted in the past five, six years. They all look like they're going to hit their ceiling very soon. Mm-hmm. And now you take draft primo, which is a stretch. But uh, uh, to them, apparently, he must be like, they think he could be a star, I'm guessing. yeah. If you take him at 12, you think he's going to be a star. Right. But you have a bunch of young guys that are stuck, either stuck in the middle or it looks like they've already hit their ceiling. Mm-hmm. So, I, I don't know, man. San Antonio, that that whole thing might be. Yeah. That era is over. Another one that I'll point out too that I mean it's again it's kind of like OKC. It's not the worst, but there's some question marks to it. Is the Washington Wizards? Um, so they traded away Russell Westbrook. Um, they got Kyle Kuzma, Contavious Caldwell Pope. They ended up Montrez. trading. Yeah. They they ended up trading for uh, Aaron Holiday as well, and then they drafted Corey Kispert and Isaiah Todd. Both are great players. Well, I, Isaiah Todd is a big question mark. Right. Kis- Kispert can come in and shoot immediately. Right. But that's what I'm saying. Like, Corey Kispert, overall, I like as a player, but because of that Russell Westbrook trade, they have KCP, they have Kyle Kuzma, they have Davis Bertans, they have Rui Hachimura. If they would have maybe gotten a deal done to get Bradley Beal out of there, maybe I would have understood it more. But I just feel like there's going to be hardly any minutes for Corey Kispert. I don't know. It just, it just felt kind of odd. Um, yeah, I, honestly, I think Isaiah Todd is going to be like the 11th or 12th man on the bench. I don't think he's going to no, play it, much. No, it will be because they have yeah, – Kis- like, Kispert is going to get some time coming off the bench shooting. Because they have like Daniel Gafford and Montrez Harrell and stuff like that. Yeah. Thomas Bryant. Thomas Bryant, see, I would have – that's almost, the yeah. That's the one that's weird. What are they gonna do with him? I almost would have liked them to take in Sanguin because he he fell and he was there. He was available because Thomas Bryant's coming off an ACL injury. Thomas Bryant was pretty good when he played, but coming off an ACL is really tough. So I don't know. I felt like they maybe should have solidified that a little bit earlier, and then instead of going with the the upside, I guess, of Isaiah Todd. I don't know. It was, it was just another one of those kind of weird, odd picks. And then the other one that I would say that I didn't like uh, is the Knicks. Because I thought the Knicks had a lot of opportunity to do a lot of different things with their draft. Yeah. I'd, trading out of 20 and then drafting Quentin Grimes at 25, mm-hmm. even though I like Quentin Grimes, it was odd. Because yeah. like you said, they had a ton of options at 20. Right, that they could have gone to, but they yeah. they had Kai Jones at nineteen that they ended up trading. Um, 
Keon Johnson, they had traded bef- just before or something like that. So they had 19, 21. They traded those, end up with 25 and some second rounds. Yeah, I honestly like the Deuce McBride and the Jericho Sims picks in the second round. But, yeah, it's it's the fact of trading out of those spots. And Quentin Grimes, I don't see him being much more than, like, what Alonzo Trier was the, the few years he was in New York. Like, a guy that comes off a bench, gets, gets a, like, some buckets mm-hmm. and plays tough. But that, that he didn't last long in New York, and I don't know if Quentin Grimes will either. Yeah. So, I, I, I just think the Knicks should have stayed put where they were. I felt like they could have made some really good, good picks for them. So I felt like trading out was just just kind of odd, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I guess I you have to see in the future of what they get out of it. But they also got Rokas Jokobitis. Well, who I've I've heard he's a crafty lefty guard from Europe, but I I haven't looked into him. Yeah. So yeah. All right, let's switch over. Who do you think had the better draft? Look at teams that did really well. You there are a of, lot of there you, are a lot of teams that had really good drafts. You kind of already mentioned the Rockets. Yeah. Seemed like they did pretty solid. After I thought about it more, Orlando taking Jalen Suggs and Franz Wagner I think was really good. Mm-hmm. I, I, re- I think you couldn't pass up on Suggs because, like we said, their history of taking long, athletic, raw forwards <laughs> has not hit a single time yet. Yeah. There's either injury or the dude just doesn't live up to his potential. Right. So taking a proven winning guard that can defend – is a high-level passer, and has a lot of upside on offense. Mm-hmm. A guy that can start for you right now and most likely will. Really good pick. Franz Wagner, a winning player who is a really good defender, has not a lot of upside on offense, but can shoot. His free throw percentage was above 80, so his three-point his three point percentage can improve. He shot about around 35 for the season. Yeah. Just two players that can step in and give you good, good minutes and play smart basketball for you right now, mm-hmm. and not none of that chaotic Orlando stuff. Yeah, that they've shown outside of Vucevic and Fournier and a few other people, it's been chaos for Orlando for over ten years. Mm-hmm. And Suggs and Wagner give you some stability. Yeah, and what more does the what does Orlando need than that right now, especially with a first year coach, and Jamal Mosley. Yeah. No, I agree. I like that one. Uh, one I wanted to bring up is the Warriors. I don't know how they keep getting into this kind of stuff. They got James Wiseman a year ago. Now they get Jonathan Kuminga, one of the – I mean, at one point was the top five player in this draft, fell to seven. There's a there's a ton of boom or bust with him. Yeah. Yeah. But you have that opportunity, and you get a guy, Moses Moody, who really good score off the bench for them could possibly – or – because the Warriors want to be contenders, if those guys show any signs of being good in the NBA, they can go right back to packaging Wiseman, Kaminga, and Moody for some gigantic trade package. That is the one part of this that I took out of this being a good draft. Mm-hmm. Because there was a question they, question they asked during the free agency uh, NBA jump special on ESPN2. They asked the question, how long can the Warriors – develop young players, and try to contend at the same time. Mm -hmm. And what you just brought up right there, the fact that they could still trade these young pieces if they want to, and they could get back of some, like several good veterans if they wanted to with those pieces. Yeah. Yeah, so that that is a bit of a win because of that one thing. Yeah. I definitely think that's, that's definitely a package too that you could send to the Washington Wizards and say, hey, we'll take Bradley Beal off your hands. Something like that. Um, Yeah, I, I think the Charlotte Hornets... Had an incredible draft, honestly. Really underrated, like almost top three. Because getting okay, getting James Book Knight at 11, future two guard for that team. They moved Devontae Graham. They just signed Ish Smith as a backup point guard, but he doesn't take away any minutes from Book Knight. It's pretty much him and Terry Rozier at those, at those options right now. Mm-hmm. They get Malik Monk is out. They've made all, all that space for him once they drafted him. Then... You get Kai Jones, all the upside of him, and they got him at the 19th pick. The value on that is fantastic. Yeah. 6'10", jumps out the gym, can shoot the three-pointer, but he has a lot to build on. He can block shots too, but yeah, at the 19th pick, that's good. 
And then the pick that I thought the Pistons had in the second round, JT Thor, they end up getting him too. Smooth lefty, smooth lefty jumper, really athletic. Not much game on offense, but he has a lot of potential on that side, and he can be a good defender. Mm-hmm. I think the Hornets hit on pretty much everything. And all, all three of those guys could play this season. Yeah. No, I like that one. Um, let's see. What's another one that I liked? You know who I think had one of the most underrated two? Who's that? The Jazz getting Jared Butler in the second round. Yeah, that's that's at the it's a very much a Jazz player. At too. the 40th pick, yeah. With we haven't even gotten to their free agent signings yet, but getting him as a guy a guy you know can come in and contribute for you right now. Mm-hmm. He can be Mike Conley's backup from the jump. Yeah. And with that one pick, I honestly think they they've upgraded honestly in terms of backup. And I I can't even remember who who was Utah's backup point guard this season. Who played behind Mike Conley? Uh Raul Neto. Raul Neto was in Washington. Is he? Oh yeah, you're right. This, I I can't even remember who their backup was. Mm. But there are still there are some health concerns with Jared Butler, but taking him at that pick I think is fantastic and he fits right into what they do. He can contribute from the start. Yeah. Uh, another one I was going to bring up kind of another one of those they've only they only had two draft picks but they got it done with what they had is the Pacers drafting your guy Chris Duarte at 13 and then they ended up trading to get the number 22 pick Isaiah Jackson from the Lakers I think that's also a, there's some upside there and I mean the Pacers don't need a whole lot we've already talked about like yeah. how deep their team is but it just gives them even more depth, even more possibility, uh, especially because they've had some injury concerns with Karis LeVert, TJ Warren, even Miles Turner. So just getting some backup guys that could maybe fill in nicely will be really good for them. So that one too. Any other draft picks you want to talk about? I think I on? think the Pelicans had a kind of, not like the most underrated, but... Getting Trey Murphy and Herb Jones, mm-hmm. yeah, I like those. Those are picks. those are really really solid picks for them. Mm-hmm. Trey Murphy could be a guy that plays a lot for them, and Herb Jones honestly could too, because he's a point he's a point forward type like really versatile type guy. He yeah. can shoot a little. He's a good passer. He he rebounds. He plays defense. He's not very strong, but he does a lot of things at a very good like a really good level. And then I would assume move going back home. He's never left Chicago. Yeah. That 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 is just crazy. Mm-hmm. He has played in the city of Chicago his entire life. Yep. Although yeah, Champaign, Illinois isn't technically Chicago, mm-hmm. but it's like not f- not very far away, less than an hour. And then gets gets picked by the Bulls. He's probably going to play some this year. They sign Alex Caruso, so he won't he won't play a ton. Yeah. Probably at the start, but he's going to get yeah. stuck. But that's a good transition into the free agency period. Because the Bulls first big signing of free agency possibly made some of the biggest moves this free agency. You want to break it down? So first signing of free agency, it almost seemed like as soon as the clock hit six, mm-hmm. there was an alert that Lonzo Ball signs four years, eighty-five million to the Chicago Bulls. They have their point guard, still have Kobe White. I feel like Ryan Archidiacono is pretty much like out of this out of this like thing. Yeah, now. I'm pretty sure they had said that he was pretty much out. Yeah, at this point, I I, I don't think he signed to the previously. team. They only have like nine players signed right now, so they still have like a few more to go. They signed Tony Bradley early early last night, I think. So yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, they start with Lonzo Ball, then they sign Alex Caruso, which honestly I was surprised LA didn't sign him back. Yeah, that was a surprise for me too. Yeah. They signed Alex Caruso four years. What was it like thirty? I can't remember what the exact dollar I think it's amount. Four was. years, but I don't. It was thirty something million. Yeah, it's four years, but I I can't find the yeah. So you money have amount. your starting point guard has a lot of defensive versatility. He can shoot, and your backup is another guy that is tough on defense, high IQ, can shoot a little, shoot a little, and is athletic. Mm-hmm. And then they make the biggest. Well, not the biggest, but the most, the most surprising. surprising yes, yeah. uh, signing in the offseason, Demar Derozan, 
a Chicago Bowl when everybody thought he was going to go to L.A. Chicago's good. Listen, when you got guys like Zach Levine, they traded for Vucevic. That was the first step. And now they're trying to put all the pieces together to try and contend. Yeah. Because when you have a player like that, you have to go for it mm-hmm. in the time you have. Yeah, and all of a sudden, the Bulls are a very interesting team. Uh, it took me a while to kind of figure it out because, I, I mean, originally, before it was DeRozan, I was a little bit, I was starting to get skeptical because I felt, I felt bad, I guess, because they have Patrick Williams, who they drafted with their high draft pick, and Kobe White. And now those guys are going to be not able to progress. But when you get a guy, I, like, I, I can't agree with that. Well, I, I, th- I think Pat Williams was going to play a specific role no matter what. Probably. I, I don't but, think they were looking for him to become become Kawhi Leonard. No, but like, at least be yeah. the st- be a starter, I think. Now, Laurie Markkinen and Kobe White, that's different. Kobe, where he fits in all this, that's a, that's a different question. Mm-hmm. Could he be the backup too? Maybe. That might be his role. We don't know if Laurie Markkinen or Pat Williams is going to start. I'm thinking Laurie. But it could yeah. be Pat Williams because he might fit that starting five more with the way he plays defense and how smart he is and his versatility on both ends. Yeah. I don't know. It's just it, at first it was kind of odd to me, but the more that you look at the lineup of Lonzo Ball, Zach Levine, DeMar DeRozan, Laurie Markkinen, Nikola Vucevic, if they can stay healthy, that's a big, uh, that's a big if, especially with Laurie Markkinen. Um, we've seen a little bit with Lonzo Ball, a little bit of inconsistency with Lonzo too at times. But if they can figure it out, they could be middle of the pack in the East. Yeah, last year Atlanta was the team that we predicted could make a jump. Did we both predict predict that Atlanta would make the jump after all yeah. that free agency? Yeah, and they ended up doing it, and they made the Eastern Conference Finals, which mm-hmm. nobody expected. Now, I'm not going to do the same thing to the Bulls. I'm not going to jump on the hype bandwagon. Yeah, they made a lot of progress, maybe. Yeah. They might have made a lot of progress making all these moves, and they could be in the playoff picture. I'm thinking like 7-8 seed right now because I think it's going to be – it's going to take a while for them to develop chemistry, longer than the Hawks even, because like all the moves the Hawks made fit perfectly to me. Yeah, This is going to take some more time. It could, but I, I – the only problem – I don't see any problem really with the starting lineup. I think it actually meshes pretty well. Uh, Lonzo Ball being able to – you know, facilitate the offense, set up well, Zach Levine off the ball a little bit. How are they going to play DeRozan with Zach Levine being the go-to guy? I N- think Nikola Vucevic needs to get his shots, and then DeRozan is a mid-range dude. Well, I think Markin and Vucevic can, you know, they can spread the floor. I think DeMar is just going to – he's going to have to defer. I think it's at that, at that point in his career. We thought it might have happened with the Spurs, but they had a lot of injuries and different things that occurred, and DeMar had to be that guy. So you always have that ability to – rely on DeMar if he's having a good game. But it allowed like you have a lot of shooters besides DeMar. DeMar's not always known as the greatest shooter, but Lori Markinen, Vucevic, Levine has really improved. Lonzo Ball's had some good three point shooting games. The biggest concern that I see for this team is their depth. Now they like on paper their their bench is pretty nice. It's Kobe White, Caruso, Patrick Williams. Well that's that's all I I said if they start Lori marketing because I think starting Pat Williams makes more sense. Yeah, I think I think marketing needs to come off the bench and be the score for that lineup. But yeah, yeah, but they could use Kobe White as the score off that bench. Both both of them, honestly. Yeah. yeah, and then you got other guys like Troy Brown Jr., Amari Spellman. <laughs> they just signed Tony Bradley. I don't Amari Spellman won't really play. No, I know, but yeah. even Tony Bradley, like. Tony Bradley, yeah, he's a decent backup center. That's that's going to be his job. He he rebounds and defends. That's that's pretty much what he does. Yeah. So I'm just saying their 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 depth is still lacking a little bit. So that's that's maybe the only concern that I can see for this. And of course, just staying healthy. That's one of the toughest things. So one of the biggest splashes Chicago made. Yeah, um, I I have a list of like the teams and the signings. I, I have them up too. Yeah. I I was just gonna kind of give it to you. Of, who you wanted to talk about next. I was going through all kind of the big okay. ones, like if you wanted to move to the Lakers or if you want to go to the Heat. Uh, I I was thinking about just naming off a few of the players that got the biggest contracts. Okay. First, like 
Trey yep. Young, five years, 170. Mm-hmm. He gets the max. Yep. Max. John Collins resigned for five years, 125. Steph Curry, four years, 215. Insane. Mike Conley resigned for over 100 million. Dudes, dudes are just getting paid, man. Jared Allen, our guy. So happy he got that five years, hundred million from the Cavs. Mm-hmm. They didn't screw up and be they weren't stupid. No, Mike Conley, uh, that's what I thought. Mike Conley got three years, seventy two and a half. Oh, I thought he got over a hundred. I thought it was four years over a hundred. Okay. No, he got a lot kind of a lot of a downgrade from his last contract. Okay. Well he he is getting older, so it makes sense. Yeah, he's had some injury trouble, but yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Jimmy Butler re signed for over a hundred. C P three? It's C P three, man. CP3 just he got but what, what stole. was it like four years one twenty yeah GF CP3 four years one twenty four CP3 stole money from the Phoenix Suns Shea, be, Shea Gill just got over a hundred million I think he, he got des- paid I think he deserves it though I think he's that he guy does yeah I, I he's that guy for them listen they they were very, they were an average team last year mm-hmm. and they shouldn't have been they needed to bench him the last month of the season because they were playing too well that's how good Shea has been yeah. Yeah, then a Kyle. few guys made ninety million. Duncan got his pay, mm-hmm. five, five years, years ninety. Kyle Lowry is uh, three years, ninety million, in a side and trade to the Heat. Yeah, I think Norman Powell got ninety million too, which is yes. one heck of an overpay. But Back to uh, Portland for Norman Powell. Yeah, we could go to L.A. now. Okay. Because they've made almost every move that could be made so far. So we'll talk about the Lakers, the Heat, and then the Knicks. How about that? So the Lakers doing what every LeBron type team does and tries to sign every possible veteran to a one year deal. Uh, the Lakers went out and signed my boy Carmelo. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be rooting for Carmelo this season. Uh, well, I'll personally, I'll be rooting for Carmelo to, you know, have some games here or there, but not for the Lakers. They also got my other former. Former guy Dwight Howard, he's they, back on the Lakers. Have they made the rush trade when we were here last week? No, that's not even the first thing you brought up. Carmelo first. Well, I'm talking about like free agents. <laughs> oh, okay, so I was gonna I, say the BM. Yeah. Okay. I con- no, we talked about it during the draft because it happened during the draft. I, was, I forgot when it happened. Yeah, we yeah, definitely okay. talked about. It. Uh, so they got Carmelo, Dwight Howard, Trevor Ariza, bunch of old vets that can, I don't know, be locker room guys, do something. Uh, Malik Monk on a one year deal. Kind of a shooter. Wayne Ellington, another shooter. Kent Bazemore, somewhat of another shooter off the bench. This signing, Kent Bazemore might start at the two. He could. Yeah. Uh, my favorite chance. signing that they had, though, Kendrick Nunn. Signed him to a two-year deal. And then a big one is getting uh, Taylor Horton Tucker yeah, They back. got him back, yeah. So they, they Those are really the, the two young options. Yeah. Kendrick Nunn and Taylor Horton Tucker. Yes. Everybody else is old or just a veteran. Yeah, so when they got all those veterans, it was a little bit worrisome. They're like, you you think that they're going to strike out in their free agency, but then getting Kendrick Nunn and Taylor Horton Tucker, Malik Monk, I think that helps for some of the youth. But just looking at this depth chart now, the way that ESPN has it, it it's probably going to change, could change, because you could have Taylor Horton Tucker, Kendrick Nunn, Malik Monk, Kent Bazemore or Wayne Ellington start at the two guard. You're not starting Wayne Ellington. <laughs> Come on. You're not starting Wayne Ellington. ESPN has Russell Westbrook, Wayne Ellington, LeBron James. That's ridiculous. Anthony Davis and Mark Gasol as their starting lineup. Out of – they signed Kendrick Nunn. They signed Kendrick Nunn. But, and ESPN is starting Wayne Ellington. That's why I don't look at – I don't listen to ESPN on a lot of things. But who are you going to play off the bench if you have Kendrick Nunn starting or something? I feel like Kendrick Nunn is the perfect off the bench player for them. Starting Wayne Ellington over Kent Bazemore would be nonsense. I'm not disagreeing. That's, that's all I'm gonna say. I'm not necessarily disagreeing <laughs> yeah. with you. I'm just saying that that's what the problem entails for them is now their bench is going to be some sort of combination of like Kendrick Nunn, Malik Monk, Taylor Horton Tucker, maybe. I think Malik Monk is one of the odd men out on this one, honestly. Carmelo and Dwight Howard. Like well, their their bench is weird. Dwight resigning Dwight, everybody knew that was gonna happen. So that's not the weird part. Everybody assumed Carmelo too. Yeah, no, but I'm just saying, like, their lineups are gonna be really odd. I mean, what what were they gonna sign and it wasn't gonna be odd? Let's honest, let's be honest. No, <laughs> what, I, I, what wasn't gonna be I'm not arguing yeah. against you. I'm just saying that's, that's I think I think whatever combination of players they signed 
at least they didn't sign like five centers and like three power forwards. There's yeah. a variation of each position. So yeah. they they'll have to figure out lineups, but I don't I don't see it like extremely weird. I just think there's they're just gonna have to figure out the lineups and mm-hmm. yeah. Starting Mark Gasol feels weird. Well, I I'm pretty sure they're gonna have Anthony Davis playing the five a lot of the game. Yeah. They got Mark Gasol and Dwight Howard, but Mark Gasol isn't playing like thirty minutes a game. Yeah, I mean they could do something like Russ, one of the two guards, Taylor Horton Tucker, LeBron and Anthony Davis. They could do something like that. That's possible, but Taylor Taylor ain't starting. Why not? Who else are they going to start at the three if they if they end up playing Anthony Davis at the five? I I'm, I didn't mean starting at the five. I meant like playing at the five in certain rotations throughout the game. Yeah, I'm just saying their their rotations yeah. could be odd. Mark Gasol time. and Dwight, neither of them need to play over twenty minutes a game. Yeah, they both need to hover like around fifteen or less, and and AD needs to play over thirty. <laughs> that that's yeah. what it's supposed to be. But they're going to get run into the ground, and it's going to be hard for them to, to rest guys like LeBron likes to do. You sure? I think so. I think so. It's going to look weird at times. That's I mean, all, that's obviously, all I'm saying. I, because this is basically like a new team around LeBron and AD, there are going to be some issues at the start of the season, and mm-hmm. things are going to look odd with Russ playing with LeBron. Just that alone is going to be weird from the jump. Well, just in the style of how LeBron likes to form his teams, to have Russell Westbrook, then probably a shooter at the two, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and then like Gasol and Howard mix. There's not a lot of shooters on this team. On this team. They're all on the bench. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're all on the bench. They're mostly on the bench. So yeah. figuring out that chemistry is going to be, I think it's going to be tough. That, I'm, yeah, that, I'm ready for it to blow up in their face. <laughs> I'm, that's the whole thing that I'm interested in. Where's the shooting going to come from in the starting lineup? Mm-hmm. That's that's my biggest question. Yeah, because is whoever they start at the two, that's where it's mainly going to come from. Yeah, the, the, that player and LeBron. Right. I bet Marcus Hall is going to up his three point. He's going to become Brook Lopez. I bet you. Uh, most likely. Yeah. In he's this. he's probably going to shoot like five or six a game. Yeah. When he's in, <laughs> I can yeah. see that for sure. Imagine I'm at saying that. Imagine it's like 2017. And somebody tells you in five years, Mark Gasol is going to be shooting like six threes a game. Yeah. It's, it's crazy how much this game has changed. Yeah. So the Lakers, you know, they get their veterans. They move they move the needle of going back to being contenders. We'll see what happens. Like I said, I hope it blows up in their face. <laughs> Let's move on to Miami. Miami, another big mover in the offseason that, you know, it was pretty predictable for the most part. They end up getting Kyle Lowry. In a sign and trade deal, like we said, he signed for three three years, ninety million. They get Jimmy Butler back on a max contract. Uh, Duncan Robinson, five year extension for ninety million. I think that's awesome. PJ Tucker moves from Milwaukee after winning a championship to a two year deal in Miami. I know it's for the parties and the nightlife. He was ready to get out of <laughs> Milwaukee. I can tell you that for certain. PJ Tucker is a serious dude. He's all about listen. He's in his thirties. He he just won a ring playing in Milwaukee. It's not about no, it's not about He needs about a Miami playing. beach house so he can house all his shoes. PJ, <laughs> you're not wrong about that. I'm telling you. You are not wrong about that. I am jealous of the man's <laughs> shoe collection. Um they also just that was today, right? Victor Oladipo. Uh, resigned on the minimum. He's gonna resign on a minimum deal. So if he can stay healthy by some chance, he'll be really helpful to this team. Um they also got Gabe Vincent on a two year deal. I think that's okay. Max Struss came back. Uh, I mean, he's all right. Dwayne Denman on a one-year deal. Okay. Your favorite center. <laughs> nah, he's okay. <laughs> Markeith Morris going to Miami. That's that's all right, too. So Miami kind of doing an, a similar. An, another tough guy, Markeith Morris. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're doing a similar thing to the Lakers, you know, just trying to bolster up their depth. Um, They didn't really make any big trades like people thought they might. So Well, Kyle Lowry. Yeah, I know, but at the same time, Kyle Lowry's not. I was, how big of a trade were they supposed to make? Like Kyle Lowry, like I've said like before. Like Bradley Beal? Is that what is that the type, level of trade I, you? I don't even know. But I'm just <laughs> saying, like Kyle, Kyle Lowry at this point in his career, he's a really, really good point guard. I'm not going to deny that. Every team that's trying to get to the next level is trying to get, was trying to get him. Yeah, but I don't know if it necessarily makes the Heat all that much more of contenders than they already were. Would that be the same case for every team that wanted them? Or do you think that's just for Miami? Because Philly wanted them. 
I and, think and the Clippers wanted them too. No, I think it, it's a special case for the Heat because okay. it just again it felt like the Heat fell short in the playoffs this year. Uh, a lot of them underperformed. It's more than a feeling. They just fell flat on their faces. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they just yeah they like, didn't I come think, to play. I think Goran Dragic is like a really good point guard for the Heat just in general for that team. But he's he's gone. No, I know, <laughs> yeah. but I'm just saying like going from Goran Dragic to Kyle Lowry feels like it's a big move, but I don't know if it, in, in actuality it's as big as it looks, I guess. Um because you you're going to still need production out of Tyler Hero. You're going to hope that Victor Oladipo stays healthy. You're putting a lot of weight now back onto PJ Tucker just like we saw last year from him. So, there'll be a really gritty team. They'll be fun in that aspect. But it, it comes down to the same thing. They have to be able to play good in the playoffs. I think Bam Adebayo has to take another step too. Yeah, like he he's he's become one of the like best all around young big men in this league. But he has to take an even bigger step. Yeah, and become like one of the key contributors. And now they've lost their they've lost some of their depth. You know they have Tyler Hero off the bench, Victor Oladipo. They lost. Well, they they lost Kendrick Nunn. I, I assume that's where they're sliding. They Victor Oladipo. Yes, but they lost Kendrick Nunn. They lost Goran Dragic. They lost Precious Achua. That's that's the one. Like those were that some was, solid yeah. solid bench guys. Them, for give, them them giving away Precious Achua. I was surprised about that. Yeah. But then yeah, they slide in PJ Tucker and Markeith Morris. So now you got Tyler Hero, Victor Oladipo. Uh, maybe if Victor gets healthy, he could slot in with Duncan or something. But I I know I know they like starting with Duncan. But um, Tyler Hero, Victor Oladipo, then like their depth is showing KZ Akpala, Markeith Morris, Dwayne Dedman, Max Struess, Max Struess, like Gabe Vincent, Gabe like Vincent, we just said. Yeah. Ah, man, it, it's hard. It's tough. But you know, we'll see again. Another one. We'll see yeah. what what happens. But the only difference really is no Kendrick Nunn, no Andre Iguodala. Yeah, that's really the only difference. Yeah, for the most and, part. And, but and I Goran think, is gone. Yeah, but, I yeah. think Drogic and Achua, especially late in the season, yeah, it might hurt them a little bit. Um, So, yeah, Miami looking to contend. We'll see what happens. Now to the New York Knicks. They made a lot of moves, kind of interesting moves, kind of a New York kind of offseason where yes. it feels like they did what they – they came up short of what they – Fully wanted, but they turned out okay. It it was a mix of running it back and adding yeah. and, and improving at the same time. Yep. They re-signed Taj Gibson, so they still have a bunch of power forwards. They re-signed Alec Burks, who played really well for them last I'm season. I'm surprised they signed him to a three-year deal. Yeah, his injury history makes that a bit of a concern. They signed pretty much everybody over three years except Taj. <laughs> yeah, that was my biggest problem is yeah. some of the length of the deals. Nerlens Noel... Also, somewhat had a resurgence this season. I don't mind keeping him as the backup center. Yeah. Derrick Rose, three-year deal. Chicago wanted him. Again. New York beat him out. Again, Derrick Rose is still younger than Steph Curry. People forget. Jeez, that is crazy. <laughs> uh, that is insane. They sign, They're big signings. Quote-unquote big signings. Evan Fournier to a four-year deal, 78. 78. Yeah. Um, and then Kemba Walker. I don't even know the money. I saw four years, but I haven't seen the money. Yeah, I don't know if it's like completely official. He's going to sign after OKC buys him out. So Evan Fournier, I think, is a really good pickup for them. Just adds another shooter to their team, another guy that can score. A lot which, of people were saying it's an overpay, but it seems like you disagree. Yeah, I, I just think this day and age – it's hard to get a guy, a starter, under $20 million, basically, if he's any bit good. And Evan Fournier has been really consistent for a long time now, uh, can get you 20 to 30 points a night if you want, and they need scoring to go along with Julius Randle. We saw that last season. That's kind of where they struggled. They got in the playoffs. Julius Randle couldn't carry that team any further. So they needed something, and because they kind of, I assume, fell short on other guys, they got Evan Fournier and Kemba Walker. Kemba Walker, we've seen his upside, but the last few years he's really struggled. Uh, inj the, the injury's yeah, the, been a part of it. The injuries have yeah really messed him. And the the lineup for the Celtics we knew would probably make it kind of difficult being with Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum. But this gives him another role to maybe kind of be that primary guy, him and Julius Randle. Yeah, them too, yeah. 
Evan Fournier is really good at slotting into his role. And then it takes a lot of pressure, I think, off of R.J. Barrett, which I think is actually going to help. And having Mitchell Robinson back, too, is a big thing. He needs to stay healthy. Yeah. He, they need him big time, I think. Because now I think they do have some depth nowadays. They got Derrick Gross. They got Alec Burks. Emmanuel quickly has looked great. Obi Toppin needs to take a step forward, but he's, you know, he, he's another guy that shows signs. Got Nerlens Noel. I think their, their bench is pretty okay. Yeah. It moves some of their starters into that bench role. They added some starters to take some pressure off of those guys. I think they could be solid. I, it doesn't really make them it all keeps, that it, much better. Because, it keeps them in the playoffs, but yeah. Because the hard part, too, is that they are a defensive-minded team with Tibbs. Kemba Walker and Evan Fournier are not the greatest defenders. So it's, yeah, it's a mixed bag. They're going to have to buy in. Right, and I hope they do because I like the foundation that this Knicks team has. I don't know. It's just it's another one where it's like they're kind of they're trying to keep themselves in the playoffs and I'm just a little nervous and I was talking to Malik before I'm a little nervous that this is going to end up being one of those middle of the pack teams every year and then eventually it's going to blow up in their face and they're not going to be able to get out of it and then they're back to being terrible New York. Just my feeling. And I feel like they are still this isn't the last step of the process. Although they've they they got a bunch of three and four year deals, Emmanuel quickly, Obi Toppin, Kevin Knox, Frank Nelakina, Mitchell Robinson, R.J. Barrett, plus the guys they just drafted. Mm-hmm. Those are six, seven, eight guys that could all be traded in a huge package for a another player. And I think in a year or two that will be the goal. As a, as some of these guys. Like reputation, and like they, they as they start to get better as players, they're in their second or third years. They're gonna start. They're gonna ship like three or four guys plus some picks, and they're gonna try to swing for a superstar mm-hmm. that mixes in with the veterans that they have. There's no way this is the last step. Last year was honestly like the first step, getting the right coach and building the right culture, and it's a surprise that they made the playoffs. It was unexpected. It's the re- them making the playoffs is the reason why they've added so many veterans. But I think they know as an organization that this is not a championship team. This is a team che- this is a team that they hope can win a playoff series and and threaten a team to get to the cut to the conference finals, maybe. But they know this isn't a championship team. Yeah. Even though the length of those contracts aren't very good, they're most likely hoping that they can package a lot of those young guys and go for an even bigger player two or three years down the road so then they can maybe make a run. Yep. Is it possible? Who knows? We'll see. It's their plan. I don't have the full details. This is what I'm assuming. Because their their plan has literally just started, and it's it can't be close to the end. This is a – they brought in a new regime, new coach. They have established a culture, and it's all starting to look positive. So – there are more moves to be made. Yeah. Well, that's basically it. So the only thing that I'll say, I'm only scared of the same thing happening where a couple of years ago, it was like a done deal. Kevin Durant going to the Knicks. Didn't happen. That's all I'm scared of is the Knicks just coming up short on yet another superstar, whether it be a trade or free agency. Yeah. And they're, they're still, it's crazy. There are still a bunch of guys left on the free agent market. That haven't yeah. been picked up yet. Mm-hmm. But that's already our show. Like we said, it's packed. We knew we'd be up against it. We'll have to talk about NFL training camps and stuff like that. Preseason starts. The Hall of Fame game th- is Thursday, Thursday. And preseason starts next week. So we already are seeing so, yeah. football players hit the field. It's crazy. This is views from the sideline. We'll see you guys next time. Biggest loser of the draft. Just Davion Mitchell because he has to go to Sacramento. I feel so bad. They got to move the franchise. It's getting ridiculous. What are they going to do?